sun's in my eyes. Good morning, all. I'm going to move because the sun is in my eyes. Well, today will be a little bit different because it is the Sunday before Thanksgiving, so we're going to remember Thanksgiving today. Next week, Advent starts. And rather than have communion on the second week of Advent, just kind of interrupt the flow, uh, the deacons and I decided we could have communion today, move it up a little early, and then after Christmas, we'll have our January uh, communion, which will be January 1st, so we'll kick off the new year with communion. So we decided to have communion today, which really makes sense for Thanksgiving. To remember that the meal that we partake here is holy, just like every meal can and should be. Right? One of the things Jesus told us was, every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, remember me. Really, every time we sit down to eat anything, we should remember Jesus. And so we'll do that today. And we'll think about kind of a potluck of sorts, of, of a Thanksgiving meal. Everybody brings something to the table, right? I'm sure that's a tradition in many of your households where everyone brings their specialty. Well, we'll think about that today. What is it that, it, that is your specialty? What is it that you bring to the table and we're going to hear from a multitude of voices, uh, most of which will be preaching the sermon, not me. <laughs> I'm going to bring in some thoughts from uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama, who were dear, dear friends and understood joy. And uh, so that's, that, that's part of the message today. And we're going to be led into communion by Fred Rogers of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. I've got some video of him speaking, which uh, just a, a warning, you should probably have a tissue handy because, because it's Fred Rogers, right? <laughs> uh, but it will, it will encourage us all to think about our gifts, to think about what we've been given. And of course, Thanksgiving is itself complicated because of its history, because of its colonization, because of the taking of the land. And you know, it, it didn't really happen the way that we like to remember it. Right? The story that we tell ourselves about the first Thanksgiving is a story that whitewashes things a bit. And so it is important that we acknowledge this land that we are on, this land that was taken from the Wabanaki people. And so we will acknowledge that and remember our own history. Our threshold moment will be that history of our church, how we got to where we are today. So it's all kind of a potluck. Everyone brings a little something to the table. And so let us begin our worship today with our music.
For thousands of years, the cannabis tribe of the Wabanaki lived at the confluence of the Kennebec and Sebastocook rivers. In 1692, this native village called Taconet, the second largest in what is now known as Maine, was attacked and burned by an expedition of European colonists from Boston, led by Major Benjamin Church, beginning a violent struggle that continued for a generation. In 1754, colonists built Fort Halifax and organized the township of Kingfield Plantation as part of the land patent for the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The following year saw the last of the skirmishes with the Wabanaki people. Two decades later, in 1771, the area was incorporated as Winslow. This included the land on the west side of the Kennebec, part of which was ancient burial grounds, that we now know as Waterville. Thirty years of crossing the river to get to the meeting house for both government and religious services took its toll. So on June 23, 1802, Waterville was incorporated. Since Massachusetts law required municipalities to have a meeting house and employ a pastor to preach in it, Waterville built the building, but arranged to share the services of the pastor employed by Winslow. As the nation struggled with the sin of slavery, the compromise struck in 1820 to allow Missouri to enter the Union as a slave state involved the addition of a free state, which was accomplished by Maine seceding from Massachusetts. In those early days of statehood, the people of Waterville were free to worship where and how they wanted. There was a newly founded Baptist church, some residents had a Presbyterian heritage, and surely there was interest in the new Unitarian movement. But despite the bridge built in 1824 making it easier to get to Winslow, a group of five ministers, 12 residents, and eight lay delegates from nearby congregations gathered on August 21, 1828, in the home of Captain William Pearson on Silver Street to gather the First Congregational Church of Waterville. It took seven years before the first full-time pastor could be hired, at which point plans were made to build a church building. Funds were raised through a curious but common practice at the time, the selling of pews. These became deeded property that could be sold, inherited, and when the budget required, taxed. Of course, privatizing the worship landscape creates an obstacle to welcoming newcomers. At one point, the majority of pews were owned by a single person, so it is likely that at least those were available to all. Perhaps as an intentional act of protest, longtime deacon Josiah Melcher appears to have stipulated in his will that the pew he occupied from 1859 to 1883 be forever free to any persons desiring to worship in the meeting house. That pew, with a plaque proclaiming it the stranger's pew, was deeded back to the church in 1901 and has been present where the congregation has met ever since. The church building in the center of town on Temple Street served the congregation well through times of growth and times of struggle. During the 1960s, the thriving congregation faced a difficult decision about its property. The citizens of Waterville approved a referendum for urban renewal that slated the church for demolition. The risk of the 130-year-old structure not surviving an attempt to relocate it was real. So the members voted to take a different risk. They chose to regather on the outskirts of town 
up the hill, away from the river, where they would build a new building costing $425,000, an amount equal to 17 times the annual budget at the time. That investment in the building on Eustis Parkway paid dividends in a vitality that saw many programs created that nurtured the institution, expanded the membership, and added a second minister to the staff. But the congregation did not have an exclusively inward focus. Outreach and service in mission to the community and the wider world were an important part of the congregation's identity. Over the past few decades, the broad trend has been a decline in participation in institutional religion. That meant that this congregation found itself gathered in a building larger than necessary, which was also showing its age in required maintenance that threatened to take so much of the budget that mission would be squeezed out. So another courageous act was required of this congregation. This time, the investment risk was to choose mission over maintenance, letting go of the building. Two years of pandemic mandated virtual gathering has created an odd sort of an opportunity to find identity as God's wandering people. Finding home, not in physical place, but in gathering. No longer going to church, but being church, especially in our doing. Seeking to walk in the way of Jesus. We, we are, are an open, open and affirming church. Faithfully yeah. using what we have and who we are. To, to serve those on the margins, on the margins of, our of our community. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey. You are, are welcome, welcome here. So as we give the technology a smack, we can sing our hymn. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> yeah, sing loud so they can hear us upstairs. <laughs> and they'll want to come join us.
Our scripture this morning is Psalm 98 from the Inclusive Bible. Sing a new song to Yahweh, who has worked wonders, whose right hand and holy arm have brought deliverance. Yahweh has made salvation known and shown divine justice to the nations, and has remembered in truth and love the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout to the Most High, all the earth. Break into joyous songs of praise. Sing praise to Yahweh with the harp, with the harp and melodious singing, with trumpets and the blasts of the shofar. Raise a shout to Yahweh, ruler of all. Let the sea and all within it thunder, the world and all its peoples. Let the rivers clap their hands and the hills ring out their joy before Yahweh, who comes to judge the earth who will rule the world with the justice and its people with equity. Our reading today. Don't you just love when the scripture commands you to be happy because <laughs> that's so easy to do right everyone right now be happy it's not something we do on cue usually right but there is a difference between happiness and joy that's an important thing to remember joy can be chosen happiness usually we don't have much control over right we feel ha happy or we don't and it's okay whatever your feeling is is your feeling but joy is, is an intention. It's, it's an attitude. It's something we can work toward. The holidays can be a time of forced happiness. So it's important that we think about joy versus happiness, that we think about how we're going to move into this time and find contentment and peace in the midst of our sadness over loss and change in our facing of the realities of the world where hardships exist, things that don't bring happiness. So how do we find joy? I had the joy this week of seeing the newly released movie about the friendship between Archbishop Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama. When those two got together, they were like eight-year-olds. They, they just laughed and giggled they were best pals <laughs> and the movie shows that and if you get an opportunity to see it it's available on some streaming services you can rent it and, and watch it i certainly encourage it because it will just warm your heart to see these two old saintly people just clearly enjoying each other's presence and it's called mission joy it's about finding joy and you think about the lives of these two men neither of which had any good reason to be happy, right? Archbishop Tutu was instrumental in defeating apartheid in South Africa through many, many costs. And he led the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, having people tell their truths of great pain and working towards reconciliation, not forgetting and moving on, not giving retribution for what was passed, but naming the pain and holding it. That doesn't sound like joy, does it? And the Dalai Lama, of course, had to flee his homeland and has lived as a refugee for nearly all of his lifetime. And yet he is filled with peace and joy. So how did he do it? It's got to be a trick. It's got to be a, a clue, right? Well, in this film, one of the things that uh, they present is that there's been some research done, some scientific research with MRIs. And here's, here's how it worked. There was some kind of stimulus that was painful that was applied to a person. It was uh, water flowing through something attached to their skin. And sometimes it was very hot and you'd feel the pain. Sometimes it was just a moderate uh, temperature. But before the stimulus of the pain, there would be a sound, right? They, they would beep a, a, a sound and you so you knew the pain was coming and hooked up to the MRI and looking at the brain activity 
the scientists know what parts of the brain register pain, right? So they were looking for that in this study. And there were two groups. There were those who meditated regularly and those who did not. So there were those who had trained their minds to be calm. And when the pain stimulus came, everybody, their brains lit up in those areas, everyone experienced the pain. But those people who weren't regular in their meditation, weren't trained in calming their minds, would not only start experiencing activity in their brain in those pain sensor areas as soon as the warning bell sounded, but it also lingered and flashed afterward. They experienced more pain because they anticipated it and they held on to it. Those who had practiced calming their brains had the ability to not have pain in anticipation and let it go after it happened. That's a way of finding joy, not lingering and holding on to pain, training ourselves to do that. And as one of the researchers pointed out, humanity has been around a long time and we haven't always brushed our teeth. We've learned how to brush our teeth. It's an adaptive behavior. We've learned that it's good for us and we pass it along. What if we each spent as much time practicing meditation, prayer, calming our minds as we did brushing our teeth every day? Just spend that much time learning how to find something that's not painful, something spiritual, something beyond. And these are the kind of lives that Tutu and the Dalai Lama have led, and it shows. Um, I forget which one of them now was speaking about what it means to be selfish. For you see, to train your mind, to care for yourself is an act of selfishness. But there are two types of selfishness. There's wise selfishness and foolish selfishness. And foolish selfishness is only caring about getting something for yourself. That self-centered focus and it leads to cheating others to get what you want. It leads to bullying others. It leads to violence. It leads to all those things to serve yourself. That's foolish selfishness. But there's also a wise selfishness. A wise selfishness is taking care of others' needs because that's the ultimate way to happiness. It's the ultimate way to a joyful life by serving the others' needs first is a way to bring joy to yourself. So it's a wise form of selfishness. As odd and different as that sounds, right? What do you mean to care for others first? But we all do that to certain extents and we know the joy of giving, don't we? You know, with these holidays coming up, when you are able to give to another and experience their joy at receiving the gift that you offer, how wonderful that is. Who would not want to do that? Maybe you've seen the movie Scrooged with Bill Murray. It's probably, it's my favorite yeah. Christmas movie. It's, it's wonderful. And at the end, at the end, he's preaching. I mean, that man is preaching at the end of that movie when he talks about going into your closet and getting that blanket that you don't need and giving it to someone who's cold and saying, here, have this. He said, why do we have Christmas just one day a year when we can have it every day of the year? Once you start feeling that, you're going to want that. You get addicted to it. You want it every day. That is wise selfishness. Doing good so that you feel good. And there's nothing wrong with that. Tutu spoke of the doctors without borders. And why would anybody do that? Think about the work, the, the risk that, that doctors put themselves at to go help others in difficult, dangerous situations, risking the disease being their own the, and going into war zones. Why would anyone do that? It's because that's who they really are. Because they're doing what they know is right and they are doing it for themselves because they'd feel badly if they didn't. They feel good because they do, because we are all wired to care for one another. That's who we are as humans. If we can shift our thinking to that, 
So that kind of understanding. Bishop Tutu said, everyone is made for perfection. Everyone is made for perfection. You are not perfect yet, but you are a masterpiece in the making. You are a masterpiece in the making. Be foolish in a wise way and seek that because joy is the reward of bringing happiness to another. Amen. So let us turn to our joys and our concerns and share them with one another that we might come before our God with them this day. So um, beginning with those who are online, if uh, you'd like to unmute yourself and share, please use the chat for anything that you want to make sure is included in our weekly uh, email. Anyone online? Well, then anyone here in the room, can, can someone bring the microphone to them? Um, two joys. Joys for Pat's birthday tomorrow. Hey, <laughs> happy birthday, Pat. And um, my second joy is we're getting a new kitten this afternoon, so we're excited about that. <laughs> ah. So we'll pray for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A prayer is for our youngest grandson, Chase, who's recovering from three surgeries at Boston Children's Hospital and now has been diagnosed with Lyme disease. This is our prayer. I'm praying again for my daughter, Nancy Hale who had an allergic reaction to the antibiotic she was placed on by her Portland urologist. The open heart surgery in Portland depends upon when the infections can be controlled. This is our prayer. Uh, I went out with uh, Bangor, Greater Bangor Area Street Pastors on Friday night, um, and I would like to offer prayers for a friend that we met named James, who we met outside of a warming shelter uh, downtown, and were able, after about half an hour, to convince him to walk all the way over to the Mansion Church, which has a warming shelter slash uh, place to sleep. Um, and when we got there, and we were about to say goodnight to him, he just started crying because he couldn't believe that people would want to help him. So prayers for folks that feel that way. This is our prayer. Um, I have three things. Um, first, uh, continuing prayers for the hungry and the homeless. This is our prayer. Um, and second, uh, prayers for the victims and the families of all 601 mass shootings that have happened in this country so far this year. This and third, um, my friend Carol has been diagnosed with um, cancer in her ureter. Fortunately, I mean, if you've got to have it, stage one is, um, it's stage one. Um, so, uh, prayers for her. This is our prayer. My joy is that I love bragging about our church's ministries, the Essentials Closet, the Starfish Village, the Stone Soup Cafe, and even the Laundry Quarters. This is our prayer. I ask for prayers for our niece, uh, Laura, who uh, has had a 
case of Guillain-Barre syndrome as a result of her COVID. This is our prayer. The Downings are sharing that uh, their son-in-law, Scott Thrasher, who's a uh, warden, was in an accident on duty and his uh, truck was totaled, but he is okay. So we pray for him. This is our prayer. Um, I know it's a developing story and it's related perhaps to what you were thinking of, Nancy. I heard this morning there was a shooting at a club in Colorado last night. Um, a hate crime, it seems, directed at the LGBTQ community. So we keep them in mind. I, I read that there were five deaths. I don't know if that number's changed. This is our prayer. Let us move into some silence. Even as we hear the activity of the world above us, those celebrating the gift of giving in the trees. <laughs> but let us reflect on those things that God is calling us to and open our hearts to God with those things that we hold dear. Let us pray. Oh God, today we recognize the gift of Ubuntu. Ubuntu, that principle that recognizes that human beings need each other for survival and well-being. That each of us is a person only through other persons. That you designed us so that we might find our meaning, our purpose, our understanding of self in others, in community, that we are all built for community. And so we thank you for the gift of community, community that we build across time and space with those who've gone before and whom we miss, but yet speak to us in mysterious ways still. Those who we do not know, who are yet part of this human race, perhaps those yet to be born to whom we have a responsibility, or perhaps to those who in their living feel like no one else cares, or perhaps worse, that no one should care. Open ourselves up to you, God. Open us. Show us that you dwell within us, that each life is sacred because each life is breathed with the holy. May this truly be our inspiration that we might face these days with the struggles that are before us and the joys that punctuate our time. that we might be thankful, truly thankful people, knowing that we are abundantly blessed, not only with material things, but with that which matters, with one another, with meaning and purpose, and love, love beyond our wildest imagination, your love for us, and for all, shown to us most especially in the one we know as 
Jesus, whom we call the Christ, who when he was among us left words of a prayer that we might share them together with your people in all times and all places, words that we share together now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The QR code on the screen will take you to the spot where you can do the magic of online giving. <laughs> and I hope that that's the case for many of you, that you're able to do that. Uh, the old-fashioned way works as well with the plates. If you're physically here, and put it in. Or if you want to put a check and an envelope and put a stamp on it. Real old-school stuff. You could do that too. All of those things are appreciated. And even more so are those pledges which we dedicated last week, which are not complete. Carl tells me that there are some who, and we're not calling anybody out by name, of course, but if the shoe fits... If you, you know, there are some who have pledged in the past who haven't gotten their pledge in yet. And I know it's, you know, it's one of those things, but it's so helpful to budgeting if we know what to expect. And you might be thinking, well, I'm just going to keep giving what I'm giving. That's fine. Just write that down, please. <laughs> it makes life a lot easier when you're writing a budget to say, okay, I can count on that. That being said, it is good that we are generous and that we are blessed by God to be able to do that. And so let us give not just of our treasure, but of our time and of ourselves. Let us be the people that God wants us to be and be the gift to the world that God has created in us. The time with children today is really not for children, <laughs> but it's Fred Rogers who didn't speak to anyone in a way that a child couldn't understand. And so I have some uh, condensed, edited uh, version of his speech to a uh, commencement speech to uh, Marquette University in 2001. And the reason I looked it up is the practice that he did very regularly in asking people to be silent and remember. And so that will happen in here and when that happens definitely do what he says because you know it's mr rogers <laughs> so our time with children ladies and gentlemen i present mr fred mcfeely rogers founder and creator of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, who will deliver the commencement address. Could you be mine? Could you be mine? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I must say, it's a beautiful day in the, your neighborhood. Wow. <laughs> Just wonderful. I am so proud of you. You know, for a long time, I wondered why I felt like bowing when people showed their appreciation for the work that I've been privileged to do for so long. What I've come to understand is that we who bow are probably, whether we know it or not, acknowledging the presence of the eternal. We're bowing to the eternal in our neighbor. You see, I believe that appreciation is a holy thing. 
that when we look for what's best in the person we happen to be with at the moment, we're doing what God does. So in loving and appreciating our neighbor, we're participating in something truly sacred. Beside my chair in my office is a framed piece of calligraphy with a sentence from Saint-Exupéry's book, The Little Prince. It reads, L'essentiel est invisible pour les yeux. What is essential is invisible to the eye. I feel the closer we get to knowing and living the truth of that sentence, the closer we get to wisdom. What is essential about you that is invisible to the eye? And who are those who have helped you become who you are today? Anyone who has ever graduated from a university, anyone who has ever been able to sustain a good work, has had at least one person, and often many, who believed in him or her. We just don't get to be competent human beings without many different investments from others. I'd like to give you all an invisible gift, a gift of silence to think about those who nourish you at the deepest part of your being. Anyone who has ever loved you and wanted what was best for you in life. Some of those people may be right here today. Some may be far away. Some may even be in heaven. But if they've encouraged you to come closer to what you know to be essential about life, I'd like you to have a silent minute to think of them. One minute. whomever you've been thinking about, just imagine how grateful they must be that at this extra special moment in your life, you're remembering them with such thanksgiving. You know, the Greek word for thanks is eucharist. The way we say thank you to God and to each other is the greatest imaginable form of appreciation. In fact, the reason we were created in God's image, in God's tselem, is to be God's representatives on this earth, to do here what God would do to take care of the land and each other as God would take care of us. You don't ever have to do anything sensational in order to love or to be loved. 
the real drama of life, that which matters most, is rarely center stage or in the spotlight. In fact, it has nothing to do with IQs and honors and the fancy outsides of life. What really nourishes the soul is the knowing that we can be trusted, that we never have to fear the truth, that the foundation of our very being is good stuff. I wanted to be with you today because I know that many of you grew up with the neighborhood, some as children, some as parents, and I'm really proud of the way you've grown. And before I say goodbye and bow again to the eternal within you, I'd like to give you the words of one of my favorite neighborhood songs. This song is called, It's You I Like. It's you I like. It's not the things you wear. It's not the way you do your hair. But it's you I like. The way you are right now, the way down deep inside you. Not the things that hide you. Not your diplomas, they're just beside you. But it's you I like every part of you, your skin, your eyes, your feelings, whether old or new. I hope that you remember, even when you're feeling blue, that it's you I like. It's you yourself. It's you. It's you I like. Congratulations to you all. It's you I like. It's not the things you wear. It's not the way you do your hair. It's you I like. The way you are right now Way deep inside you Not the things that hide you Not your toys They're just beside you But it's you I like Every part of you, your skin, your eyes, the feeling, whether old or new, I hope that you remember even when you're feeling blue that it's you I like, it's you yourself. It's you. It's you. I like. This is not our table. We're invited to it. The host is the one who loves you just the way you are and loves you enough to challenge you to become the person you've been designed to be. The one who likes you. It's you God likes. And so we come here with our full selves, ready to be fed bringing to the table our gifts, acknowledging that we don't always do that. 
So let us begin with prayer, seeking God's forgiveness. Oh God, forgive us for forgetting that what is essential is invisible to our eyes. Forgive us for not acknowledging the gift of ourselves. Forgive us when we are foolishly selfish and grant to us the wisdom to find ourselves in community, in Ubuntu, in knowing that we are individually because we are collectively. In silence, let us take a moment to offer to God our individual confessions. Friends, the very, very good news is the love of God. There is no one not invited to the table. There is no one who is unworthy. We do that to ourselves. And so let us lift that burden and accept the forgiveness of our God. And as a forgiven and joyous people, let us truly do what is holy, appreciation, let us appreciate ourselves and one another. I invite you to share the peace by bowing to the holy, the eternal, in your neighbor. Peace be with you. At this table, we gather, bringing our gifts and seeking the greatest gift, the gift of thankfulness. Eucharist means to be thankful. As a grateful people, when we gather later this week, we will be giving thanks. Here, let us remember the holiness of that, taking the gifts that are given to us, Remembering that Jesus took food, simple food, food of a feast, of a joyous meal with friends. And he took the bread and he sought God's blessing upon it and he broke it. And he offered it to his friends at the table as he offers it to us today. Reminding that us that it is given for us. And after the meal, he took the cup. Raising it, he looked to the heavens and to God's blessing upon it, and then assured all present that there is a new covenant of forgiveness in this cup, that it represents his blood poured out willingly, lovingly, that we might know joy in our forgiveness. And so this covenant of this meal is made sacred not by the words we say or the content of the cup and the plate, but by the presence of our God, who is present with us as the body of Christ. And so as the body of Christ, let us lift our voices together to seek a blessing upon these elements. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Renew our communion with all your saints, for saints no longer with us, especially those who have wandered here. For all saints now living among us, who gift us with their presence in our lives, and for saints who will come after us, continuing your good news into the future. By your spirit, 
make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Friends, whoever you're thinking of during that time, whoever has made you who you are, those gifts that you bear because others have given them to you, bring that and yourself and your hopes for the future to this moment of feasting. The table is spread, all gifts are ready. Let us partake in the feast. And in gratitude and joy, let us offer to God our prayer of thanksgiving. Thank you, eternal host, for filling us with joy at the feast. Gathered around your table with siblings present in multiple places and multiple ways, we have tasted of your promised feast in that place, that time, that life beyond this, where all hurtful, sorry, where all hurtful words silenced. All is again fine. Where hope and grace are closest friends, we rejoin with hearts and voices, sisters and brothers, who for one, Amen. So a few announcements as we move from this time to. Other times, the other time being Advent, which begins next week. So there are a few instructions. <laughs> Aren't there always instructions? Uh, doesn't include batteries. You have to put it together. No, it's... We will be using as a theme through Advent, reflecting the sacred. And that theme is in part based on the writings of Richard Rohr a book that some of you have read called The Universal Christ. So, yes, that's not The Universal Christ. This, <laughs> which Sarah very observantly pointed out, is not the book The Universal Christ, is a companion book of, dead, of reflections, 40 reflections based on that work. So, if you've read, the, if you have a copy of The Universal Christ, reading it will provide background. If you'd like to read it, be my guest. Uh, but this book will be part of our structure if you want to have an intentional devotional during Advent, something that uh, is that you have in common with everyone else. Um, the 40 readings will be ordered in a way that reflect each week's theme, and you'll get that list. I'll, I'll put that out in the uh, margin notes in midweek, and uh, we'll have printed copies of that. And there will be a journal that if you'd like to journal your thoughts that arise out of that, or just arise from the prompting questions, which are in the journal. And again, I will post on social media and in our, our email newsletter so that if you have some, some thoughts about it, write it down. That's great. You can keep it to yourself. You can also show up on Thursdays at our regular Thursday gathering at seven o'clock on Zoom at this uh, Zoom location, our worship time. Um, you, can, uh, you can show up uh, on... Uh, uh, there and share what you're what you're thinking or just show up there without having done any of the reading or even be aware of the question and still experience time and fellowship together so there are no requirements but these are tools that you might want to uh, utilize to make the experience of advent maybe a bit more sacred and take back the war on christmas right it's <laughs> I like to say the war on Christmas is over. The 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 society culture won. They can have Christmas. We have the we have Advent, 
and we have the Feast of the Nativity. And so we will have that celebration throughout uh, the season. Uh, part of our practice each week is will be an anointing because Christ, Christos in Greek, literally means the anointed one. And so the end of the service, a part of the benediction, will be an anointing. And the way we're going to do that is if you are not physically present, find yourself something to anoint yourself with, right? Hand lotion, face cream, anything like that works just fine. Uh, you could go all out and get some oil. Uh, you could add essential oils to it, some frankincense maybe. If you're here, there will be an opportunity to anoint yourself with some oil with frankincense. So that will happen on site, but if you're not here, take care of that on your own so that we can still share that time together. So that would be uh, something, and we'll do it, we'll, we'll distribute it, you can sort of anoint yourself or someone in your bubble, you know, if you're comfortable with, with someone who's near you, but uh, that's that'll be part of each week's service during Advent. And uh, obviously we will be lighting the Advent candle wreath, and uh, so, which I'm pointing to like you can see it, it's not there, you know, it will be, but you know, uh, but if, again, if you're at home during the worship service, if you're celebrating that way, perhaps you have your own Advent wreath at home that you might have ready when you prepare to come to worship, or just a candle. And uh, if you're at home, you can actually, you know, use a flame, which we're not allowed to use here. So, uh, you know, you can have a real live candle if you'd like. So just so that we're prepared for that, what's coming up. Also, uh, it's always a good practice if you'd like to... Uh, to participate in counting the days rather than getting a chocolate out of a calendar, a reverse Advent practice is put something in a box every day that you're going to give away. Something for the essentials closet, something for the food bank. Uh, you know, if you'd like, just if you're not into counting, you just want to help, just get a case of canned vegetables. You'll have 24, and on Christmas Eve, you're like, ta-da, it's counted down, right? So you don't have to do it. But but it's uh, especially if uh, if you've got young ones at home and you want to mark the days and see the time build, putting something in a box that you're giving away is a much nicer thing than, well, I mean, they can still get a chocolate, right? You know, why not? But uh, maybe they earn it by putting something in. So we encourage that practice as well. There will be uh, more details about what we're doing at Christmas and all of that when we get a little closer next week. We can go over that. But I just wanted to give you this heads up. Watch for things in the midweek email and uh, uh, and on social media. Then also today we are having our coffee fellowship. Uh, what do we need to know, Margo? Where, food's in the hall? But just grab something in the hall. It'll be there. That's that's where you go. And uh, and you can uh, you can take it and and go sit. I assume the family room's open, right? You can go sit in there, or you can come in here. But if you come in here. Don't expect to just sit because we'd like to uh, put many hands to work, making the work light by uh, starting to decorate for the holiday. So the decorations are right here. We can bring them out. And if people are around and helpful, we'll get that done in a quick way. And uh, then we will have to come back during the week if we do it well, right? So we'll see how that goes. But uh, that's, that's happening today. So anything else? I feel like I've forgotten something, but... That's an awful lot to take in anyway. Yes, Bill. <laughs> this really isn't an announcement as much as a perhaps a mini creation care moment. I'd like to draw your attention to a, an opinion piece that was in the main papers, perhaps Friday, but certainly yesterday and online this morning, from three, three major faith traditions in the U.S. in Maine, the Catholic Church, the Episcopal Church, and the Orthodox Church, uh, pointing out man's responsibility to the environment and to participate in that. And they had some specifics, and I won't get into that. But uh, that's three major church groups who have not made much of a show of doing any of that sort of thing. So if you have some friends from those, those traditions, uh, Engage them in the conversation and maybe point that out to them. All right. Thank you. Anything else? Well, let's sing our closing hymn.
friends, you do not need to do anything spectacular or special or out of the ordinary in order to love or to be loved. Take that gift with you as you go and live that out in real ways so that the world sees the gift that you are. And in doing so, gives glory to God, the creator. May this creator God, who knows even the sparrow that falls, lift you on gentle breezes to soar with eagles and grant you wisdom and insight. And give glory to the Christ who comes to you and challenges you in the least, the last, and the lost. May the Christ bless you with a gift of tears that you might shed them with those who weep. And give glory to God's wild, untamed Holy Spirit. May God's wild spirit, wild as any wild goose, lead you into those places where you won't go without a chase. And grant you a touch of foolishness to believe that you are who God likes, just the way you are. And may the love of God be with you all, and all those whom you love, and all those whom none but God loves, now and until that day of God's judgment, when justice will roll down like waters, and peace will blossom among all the peoples. Amen. Amen.